presentation of the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Francisco Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 66. Wanted for bank robbery. Two men. Four masks. No other description. These men are armed and dangerous. That's all. Attention all cars, new city orders. Use only Rio Grande cracked gasoline for all more all emergency equipment. Merced, California, effective immediately. All Merced police cars and fire engines that switch to Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Calling all Berkeley police cars. Rio Grande cracked gasoline has been specified by the city of Berkeley for all police, fire, and emergency equipment. Arizona calling. Attention all Maricopa County Sheriff's cars and emergency equipment. Maricopa County insists that Rio Grande cracked gasoline be used exclusively. Los Angeles police calling all cars because our city has found that Rio Grande cracked gasoline is faster, more powerful, and more economical. We have awarded the Los Angeles City gasoline contract to Rio Grande for the third consecutive year. That is all. Tonight, it is our pleasure to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. One of the most interesting and mystifying oddities of police work is the strange mental quirk which so dominates the personality of certain unfortunates that they would rather dedicate themselves to a life of crime than one of respectability in a world offering them every opportunity for success. This type of criminal is a difficult one with whom to deal. He is more intellectual than the usual criminal type. He believes that only fools work. And he sets out to collect the living he feels the world owes him. But he never succeeds in gaining a safe, easy life. No criminal, no matter how momentarily successful he may be, achieves safety or contentment. This drama indicates more forcibly than words how true this is. It is just an hour before closing time at the Western State Bank in Los Angeles. One of the tellers notices a well-dressed young man approach the window and then seems to change his mind. The teller, seeing that the newcomer is hesitant, is about to speak when suddenly the young man walks up to him. Keep your mouth shut and shove those bags notes under the grill. You'd better hurry or let go of this bottle. Say, what is this? If you make you any more careful, I might tell you there's enough nitroglycerin in this little bottle to blow everybody in this bank to pieces. So just keep smiling and look as though nothing were wrong and hurry up. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. Thanks. You're a smart young fella. Now, if you'll just be smart enough to keep quiet until I get out of here, you'll probably continue to live for a long time. The polite young man walks calmly out of the bank, steps into a car at the curb, and drives off. But the teller in the bank has not waited for him to get far before he notifies the police and gives a perfect description. Fifteen minutes later, the bandit is stepping out of his car in front of his house when the police car draws up alongside and two policemen leap out with guns in their hands. Wait a minute, young fellow. What's your hurry? Why, well, I'm in no hurry. What do you fellows want? Well, I think you know well enough what we want. Where's the money? Hey, what the devil are you talking about? I don't know anything about any money. Well, we'll just take a look through your pockets and then maybe you'll have a different story to now, tell. Now, wait a minute here. I don't know what you're trying to prove, but I can assure you that I'm not going to stand here and let you search through my clothes. I haven't done anything. Now, isn't that just too bad? Bill, be very careful that you don't follow this gentleman's suit when you look in his pockets. 
We wouldn't want to do that, would we? No, I should say we wouldn't. No, mister, if you just stand quiet for a minute till I see what you got here. Oh, well, well, nice crisp bank note and a Western State bank marker band around them, huh? Well, what do you say to that now, young fella? Well, is there anything wrong in having some money in your pocket? I just drew that from my account at the bank. Just drew it from your account at the bank, huh? Well, I'm afraid you'll have little use for it for a while to come. All right, Bill, let's give this banking gentleman an escort to the police station. I'm sure the chief would just love to meet him. Now, listen, you're making a big mistake about this. When you get me to the station and I tell him who I am, it'll go pretty hard with you. My father's a good friend of the chief. Is that so? Well, maybe you and the chief can have a nice little chat, and then we'll all go over and have dinner together. That'd be nice, wouldn't it, Bill? Oh, I'd be delighted. <laughs> One of these days, you smart cops are going to laugh out of the other side of your face. <laughs> A few minutes later, at police headquarters, the suspect, still loudly proclaiming the fact that it's going to be tough on the officers when he sees the chief, is ushered into chief's office. Well, well, what's the trouble? Well, we've got a young fellow with us who seems to feel that we've done a terrible thing to arrest him. Maybe he'd like to tell you what it's all about. What's he charged with? Bank robbery. He walked in about an hour ago and lifted $1,000 from the teller in the Western States Bank. We got a call on it, and from the description of the car he drove off in, you were able to pick him up 15 minutes after he pulled the job. He still had the money on him. What did you get to say to this? All these cops are crazy, too. I told them where I got the money, but they didn't believe me. Where did you get it? Well, I drew, I drew it out of a savings account. I was going to buy an automobile and take a trip. I see. Well, that ought to be easy enough to prove. I'll just check with the bank, and if they say you have an account, everything will be all right. What name is the account under? Why, uh, Summers. George Summers. Brown, you put a call into the bank and check that name. You'd better have the teller who saw the man take a run over here. Yes, sir, I'll do it. Sit down, Mr. Summers. Thanks. What business are you in? Well, I'm connected with a brokerage office. Oh, a broker? How is business this year? I'd heard things weren't so good on the market. Oh, I don't know. I don't suppose things were any better than they were last year. And you must have done pretty well to be able to afford a new automobile. A new automobile? Oh, yes, a, a new automobile. You hadn't forgotten about it, had you? Uh, no. No, of course not. Why don't you give up, Summers? You pulled that job and you haven't any accounts with the bank. Now, why don't you save yourself a lot of trouble and stop lying? I'm not lying. Why would I want to lie? You're pretty cool, aren't you? Well, that's all right with me. As soon as Brown is checked with the bank, it won't be necessary for you to tell me anything. Only I thought that you might want to tell me about it before the others got back. You don't look like a criminal, Summers. You look like a college man. Why the devil did you want to go around holding up banks? I didn't want to go around holding up banks. And if you think you can make me say something incriminating, you're crazy. Okay, have it your own way. Well, they get the bill for you, please. Fine, come in. There's no account listed under the name of George Summers. They never heard him. I see. Did you speak to the teller? Yes, he's on his way over here now. Thanks, Brown. That's all. Yes, sir. Well, Summers, what have you got to say to that? Well, I don't suppose there's anything much I can say, is there? Why in the deuce were you so bound and determined to stick to that crazy story of yours when you knew the bank would deny it? Just want to be more trouble to the police? No, I don't know. This is the first time I've ever done anything crooked. I guess I sort of hoped to talk my way out of it. I'd always talk my father out of giving me a licking for something I'd done wrong, and, well, I guess I thought I could do it with you. And maybe now that you know you can't, you'll tell me all about it, right from the start. Well, I work for my father, and he only pays me $25 a week. I figured that I could make a bit of money from this job and then quit. I didn't mean to make a habit of it. You weren't satisfied with your wages, eh? Well, that's certainly too bad. I'm afraid the state pays them a lot less when they're boarding you at San Quentin. Well, they can't send me to San Quentin for this, can they? They not only can, but I can assure you they will. In the trial, it develops that the name Summers is an alias, the real name being James Stanley. As this is his first offense, he is sentenced to Sam Clinton with a recommendation for parole at the end of one year. Stanley is a model prisoner. At the end of the year, he is released and returns to his home in Los Angeles. His father offers him his old job. 
And for two months, father and son carry on business with perfect harmony. But suddenly, the serenity of the eldest family is once again given a jolt when at the end of the week he discovers money missing from the company's safe. Refusing to believe that his son has taken it, he fires one of his employees and changes the combination on the safe. But at last, after changing the combination five times, after firing five employees, Mr. Stanley faces the realization that his son is the only possible guilty person. Sick with bitter disappointment over the weakness of his son, he waits until the rest of the staff have gone home and then calls him into the office. Yes, Dan? What's on your mind? Dan, I have something to say to you. Something that I've hoped and said and almost believed would never become necessary. Why, well, what do you wait? There's no use in your trying to deny anything. Nothing you can possibly say can do you any good. I want you to listen until I'm finished, and then you may do as you like. I'm an old man, Dan. I've had many bitter pills to swallow in my lifetime. Pills that I thought at the time were the worst I would ever have to take. And if there's been one thing that I've fought for, one thing that kept me going on fighting to build a business to be proud of. That one thing, James, is you. Yes, but no, I don't say anything until I'm through. I won't be long. My boy, you've been my one hope. I forgave you when you took the first time. I thought I knew you. I tried to delude myself by looking everywhere, anywhere but towards you during the last few months. I've discharged men who were faithful to me for years. And after all this, I find that there's only one answer. I've been stealing for my faith. Now, wait a minute, Dad, I have. have. I've known inside me all the time that you were doing it, but I tried and insisted that I was wrong. But no matter what was the case, you could never do such a low, sneaking thing to your own father. Now, I've only one more thing to say to you. I've taken all the faith that I have or will ever possess in human nature and destroyed it. And I want you to leave tonight. And I don't ever want to see or hear of you again. You've chosen your own way of living. Well, follow it. But if I ever see you on the street, I shall not recognize you. To me, you are completely and forever a thing of the past. From this moment on, you are dead. All right. All right, throw me out in the street and have a good time while you're at it. You think I'm going to cringe and crawl to you? Well, you've got another thought coming. I don't care if I never see you again. It suits me just fine. If you paid me any sort of a decent salary, maybe I wouldn't have had to walk off with any money. But you're too cheap to give me more than just what's enough to keep me living. All right, I'm leaving. And one of these days you're going to hear about me, and here plenty. I'm going to have money, and I'm going to have so much that I won't have to work another day in my life. <laughs> Six years roll by. Six years in which Stanley becomes known to the police of the West as the Phantom Bandit. He is wanted by the San Francisco police for having perpetrated more than a score of daring holdups. Thirteen robbery victims identify a picture of Gene Stanley, alias George Summers, as the man that robbed them. The police of every Western city are notified by police circulars to be on the lookout for it. But always he manages to stay out of jail. September 13th, 1928. The Lark, Los Angeles bound, is standing in a small watering station only a few miles from its destination. In the club car, a group of San Francisco and Los Angeles businessmen are discussing plans for the coming year. Golf, business and the usual small talk of the smoking car. Suddenly, the door at the end of the coach opens, letting in a blast of cold September air. Two men and a woman step in, and the travelers find themselves looking into the business end of two guns held by the men. Will you be so kind, gentlemen, if you just line up over there against the ball and put your hands above your head? I am sure you will be no violence. Now, 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 I strongly advise you not to make any unusual noises that might attract the attention of the conductor. It would be too bad if my friend and I had to shoot somebody. Look here, man, you can't get away with this. Shut up. Lydia, yeah? lift those guys and let's get out of here. Okay. Yeah, you know, you see, you've annoyed my friend. You know, if I were you, gentlemen, I think I'd do just as I was told. It'll only take a minute. 
everything. Okay, let's go. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And I wish you all a very pleasant journey. Oh. April 17th, 1929. Stanley and McNabb, California's two-man crime wave, clean out the Oakland Bank on College Avenue. Two months later, on June the 14th, the same daring pair stalk into the Bank of America, Shattuck Avenue, and Dwight Way and Berkshire. Towed seven passengers into submission and walked out with $18,000. San Francisco police are completely baffled as to the identity of the bandits, but from witnesses managed to compile a fairly complete description. Every policeman on the force is warned to be on the lookout for them, but weeks pass and nothing is heard of the bandits there. And one day in the chief's office, the phone rings. Hello? Very well, put them on. Hello? Hello? This is Steve Waller, Dan Hoover. Yes? According to the circulars here, you're looking for a George Summers. For That's Rocky. right. Well, Summers ordered a car to be shipped to him at San Francisco at death. I thought he'd want to know. That's right. What's the address? 23 Ort 4 Leavenworth Street. 23 Ort 4 Leavenworth Street. Right. And thanks a lot. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right, boys. Here's something for you to do. You also this address and see if you can pick up this bird. Detective Sergeants William McMahon, George Wall, Otto Meyer, and Robert Rauer lose no time in getting to the address. They find it to be an apartment house. So McMahon decides to question the manager. Jordan, what can I do for you? We're looking for a person by the name of Summers. I understand he lives here. Well, who are you? We're officers of the law, and we want to see this man. Well, there is no one here by the name of Summer. Are you sure of that? Perfectly. That's mighty strange. I was told by a friend of his that I could find him here. Well, you can't. Very well. I guess we'll have to search the place if you won't tell us all we can find, Summers. Search the place, is it, sir? Uh, but I tell you, I never heard of anyone of that name. Well, I'm sorry, but I was told to find him, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. That is, unless you want to tell me what apartment he lives in. Oh, uh, if I tell you, will you promise not to tell yes, me? Yes, I promise. Now, what's the number of the apartment? 204. All right, boys, let's go up and take a look. Wall, well, you better stay down here with the switchboard, and if anybody asks for the key to 204, give us a pause in the room. Okay. The rest of you fellas come with me. Well, I hope we find something more than the deserted room. The chief of the rampage about those other robberies, I wouldn't dare say she went out this way. Mm-hmm. Neither would I. Hmm. 201. 204 must be down the hall a couple of doors. Yeah, yeah here it is. Let's make sure we're alone before we walk in. Sounds like nobody's home. All right. Here, let me draw my skeleton key on the door. Well, at least the fellow who lives here hasn't skipped. Look at those clothes in that closet. More suits than I've had in the last ten years. Take a look in the bathroom while I look through this chest of drawers. Okay. Hey, Roy, come here. Yeah, what's that, man? Will you take a look at what I found in this big drawer? Hey, for a look. All right, top gun, and I'm not going to see you keep the army going for a week. Hey, this bird must be expecting some trouble. Well, uh, maybe he's expecting to give some trouble. I think we better stick around here until this jump shows up. And when he does, I'm going to watch my step with him. Yeah, you and me both. Well, shall we look around some more? Might as well. I'll see what's in the closet and you... Oh, wait a minute. I'll answer it. Might be for the guy who lives here and we don't want to kick him off. Yes? Oh, yes, Wall. Huh? Okay. Stay down there and watch for anyone else. Watch up. Mrs. Summers coming up. Mm. What are you going to do? Let her get inside. We'll hide in the bathroom and see what she does. Then we'll walk in and grab her. Okay, let's get in there. Yeah. Yeah. She's got a package. 
If he's opening that drawer. He's put the package in it. Now, let's get it. Stand where you are. Yes. Who are you? Officers of the law, ma'am. You're under arrest. Under arrest? Well, I don't know what you mean. What are you doing in here? We're waiting for your husband to show up. Now, we're all going to stay right here until he comes. You might as well take it easy and just sit quiet. What is it? I don't know. I think he's out of town. Out of town, eh? Well, uh, when will he be back? I don't know. All right, you can sit here as long as it's necessary. What is that package you put in that drawer? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Now, look. I don't know how long we're going to have to wait until Summers gets there. But when he does, if you try to tip him off that we're here, I warn you right now that we're prepared to shoot it out. And I don't think it'll turn out so well for your husband. Wait a minute, Matt. I can hear someone coming down the hall. Mm, he's probably not coming here. The wall would have thrown it. Hey, you're coming here. Quick. Start against the wall and get him when he opens the door. Yeah, home? yeah, we're here. Put up your hand. Hey, what is this? You're under arrest, Summers. Summers? My name is Summers. No? Well, what is it? That's none of your business. I'm afraid you're wrong about that. You entered this room with a key. Where'd you get the keys in, not Summers? Well, I, I've been staying here for a while. But I don't see what the devil you guys are doing here. Well, stick around. You'll find out soon enough. Raw, well, Chris is mine. Hey, you can't do that. Uh... You say that's what he went for. Say somebody might hold you up. Smart guy, ain't you? Let's see what's in this pocket here. It's sort of bulgy. Oh, huh. All right. You look at this. A roll of banknotes big enough to take a horse. Where'd you get the money? What's it to you? Somebody's got on him, Matt. All right. Put the ghost on him. Is it somebody? Who is this man? I don't know his name, but he's not my husband. You don't know his name, and yet he says he's insane. Come on, Mrs. Summers. Don't you think that's a bit ridiculous? I don't know his name. Oh, all right. I'll get it. What will do, huh? Hello? Yeah? Yeah? Okay, Wall. You better come up, too. I might need you. More, Stephanie? Yeah, Summers himself. Keep your eye on these two. I'll take care of Summers. Right. On your toes now. It's coming. All right, Summers, put up your hands over your head. What? What is this, a stick-up? No, this isn't a stick-up, Summers. You're under arrest. I've got your wife and your friend in the room here. You might as well take it easy. Oh, so you're a cop, eh? Well, all right, but take that gun out of my stomach. I'm not on. I'll believe that after I've looked for myself. What do you that package? Laundry? Looks pretty heavy for laundry. Put it down on the floor. Okay. <clears throat> now come in here and stick out your hands. Ah, let's see what's in this bundle. Let's see what's in this bundle. Ah, laundry, eh? A nice brand new submachine gun. Ron, you and I take care of this bunch. I'm going to look around this room a bit more and see if I can find anything. All uh, right, come on, you three. Out of the squad car. Walk ahead of me and see that you behave yourselves. Ah, let's see. Where to begin? Yeah, a trunk over there might be interesting. Holy smoke. It begins to look as though we'd stumbled on something a lot bigger than we thought. Wait till the teeth see this. A few minutes later, McMahon walked into the chief's office with his discovery. See? I think we got the birds who've been doing the bank jobs. This Thomas guy, his wife, and the other man I sent over. I found these in the drawer in the trunk in their room. Yeah, well, let's see what you got there. Hmm, bank notes. There's an Oakland bank wrapper still on them, huh? Traveler's checks, cancel checks. But man, you're right. There's enough evidence here to send that bunch up for 15 years. <laughs> his wife and their companion are grilled for hours, but none of them confesses to the charges. Summers gives one excuse after another. He says that a man gave him a suitcase and asked him to take care of it for a while. But when he found the currency and checks in it, he was afraid to do anything about it and hid everything in his trunk. The police did endlessly continue the questioning hour after hour. Finally, he breaks. All right, all right, all right. I'll tell you all I know about it. But I want to know what you're going to do with my wife. It all depends on what you tell me. Will you give her $100 if I tell you something? Give your wife $100? I don't know if you want me to do that for her. Never mind. Will you do it? All right. I'll do it. 
Now let's see what you've got to tell me. Well, if you'll send a couple of your men over to Boat 48 at the Yacht Harbor, you'll find the boat over there named the Sovereign. What's that got to do with you? Well, I own it. If not, my wife and I were all set to get out of here and beat it to the South Sea. We would have been gone in a week if your lousy cops hadn't have walked in. Oh, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, that's the way it goes, Stanley. I thought there was something familiar about you. You're James Stanley, and your friend is Ethan McNabb. That's right? That's right. Who did you collect McNabb? Well, I met him after he got out of San Quentin. Seemed like a pretty smart guy, so we joined up. All right, Stanley. All right, so we joined up. All right, Stanley. We'll go over and take a look at that boat of yours. I'm afraid it won't do you much good for a long time to come. Well, I wouldn't be too sure about that. A fellow doesn't have to stay in Quentin if he knows his way around. I'll be out of there in a year. Detectives are sent to the yacht harbor, and Stanley's story proves to be true. The yacht is stocked with enough food to last 30 days and carries a complete arsenal. From the harbor officials, they learned that the boat had been had sailed down from Vancouver, docking four days before, and had been bought by Stanley for $11,500. Stanley and McNabb are tried in the court of Superior Judge Homer R. Spence of Alameda County. Earl Warren, fighting district attorney of Alameda County, prosecutes the case himself and secures a conviction. On the day of July 17, 1929, the two men are found guilty of bank robbery and sentenced to Folsom for from 15 years to life. On September 7th, the same year, they are sent to Folsom, and the San Francisco police closed the book. But Stanley and McNabb, determined that they will not stay in prison, make two attempts to escape, both unsuccessful. Then Stanley strikes up a companionship with a prisoner by the name of Marty Colson, one of the toughest men in the penitentiary. Together they plan a way to break out. Colson, while working in the machine shop, constructs a homemade gun out of a piece of pipe and pieces of junk material he steals from the shop. His continual boast to Stanley is that he'll never be taken alive. Finally, after months of preparation, Colson and Stanley are ready to go. They force their way into the office of the warden. And using the homemade gun as a threat? Tell the warden and tell him to come over. And don't tip him off or I'll find you, see? All right, all right, don't shoot. I'll read him. Warden. Warden, you're worried to kill off with any important business. Yes, sir. He'll be right over, sir. When he gets here, he's going to find something that he didn't expect. Marty, what's that? What? I found out about it. So what do we do? We'll be able to guard in this place and hear the session. We haven't got a chance in our world to get well, right. What are we going to do there? I won't get me around. Hey, where are you going? Where's Colson? Over there in the corner. He said you'd never get him alive. Bumped himself off, eh? And Stanley, I guess this is the last time we get a chance to make a break. We're going to solitary. <laughs> Stanley has been in solitary confinement ever since. McNabb, after several attempts to break out of Folsom, finally made a desperate attempt to scale the walls with handmade ladders. He was caught, but in the excitement, a guard was seriously wounded. Guard was seriously wounded. Falling back on a rarely used law which reads, a life prisoner may be tried on a death charge following an attempt break in which assault is committed. The authorities tried McNabb and found him guilty. He was sentenced to hang by Judge Butler of San Rafael and transferred to the condemned row at San Quentin. There he managed to involve James McNamara, dynamiter of the Los Angeles Times, in an attempt to smuggle a piece of steel to one of his pals in the yard. Thus ends one of the most interesting cases in the history of bank robbing. Interesting because during the entire career of both McNabb and Stanley, they never had to fire a shot. They were both cool, smart criminals. But they, like all other lawbreakers, all other lawbreakers, made the mistake of being too sure of themselves. Thank you, Chief Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Davis, has just told you how the police department of the West captured these criminals again and again. We have a mighty efficient police system. 
Police even specify the gasoline in their police cars so they can make greater speed. More than any other brand, police specify Rio Grande Craft gasoline. Wherever it is sold, it powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment because tests made by progressive cities like Los Angeles, Oakland, Berkeley, Merced, and Maricopa County, Arizona, have proved that the special cracking process makes Rio Grande cracked gasoline easier to start, speedier, more powerful, and more economical. And this is the same gasoline that you get from your neighborhood independent Rio Grande dealer. Independent Rio Grande dealer. You get greater value for your money when you buy Rio Grande cracked with tetraethyl at no extra cost. And here's a bargain. At all Rio Grande service stations, an oversized quart of oil for a quarter. Sinclair Opaline oil in cans. The oil that made Sinclair world famous. Now only 25 cents a quart. With 25 cents a quart. With two ounces extra for good measure. The greatest motor oil value on the market. <laughs> Broadcast 66. The section of now in custody. That's all.